head. Okay, so this is a stream now. Uh, well, well, it's a stream to you anyway, right? Um, now it's also a, a screen record. Let me turn the thingy on. It's like a chair. Okay. Is this visible? All right. Okay, so this is this is gonna go on your channel, right? So I have to behave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so okay, I'm here with uh, Jennifer Epstein, um, mysterious <laughs> financier, extraordinaire, uh, who has some in, some curiosity in this little payment system that I'm doing. Um, called Pay. Pay. So uh, yesterday, what I was doing was looking through the um, well, it was sort of I was working through the 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 part where like someone's posted someone's initiated a payment right a payment transaction and so the system knows like how much fiat that should be what the rate was at the moment what the serial number on the thing is the amount in ae and the recipient right but it doesn't know the sender so it can't know the transaction hash yet so um at that point the chain, we've got a process that follows the chain to like check each transaction and see if it matches one that we're waiting on. Um, if it does, then, it, then that process sends a message to the ledger and says, okay, that's paid, right? And if the cashier, though, says, it's, no, wait, I want to cancel that, that cancellation could come in and then paid could come in and then it needs to become a refund or it could be the other direction, right? So you have a sequencing thing and you have to catch both sides of that um so that's what i was working through yesterday is basically like these sequencing like what are the what are the valid phase transitions that could happen to a specific page okay. so anyway um stupid stupid nonsense about message order okay yeah which is um fortunately which is we don't it, which actually, is we don't have a genuine race condition here because everything gets serialized through this one process ledger all right, I'm going to ask a dumb question. What what exactly is a race condition? Like, what's the definition of it? Okay, a race condition is where um, we have two sources of truth. Well, okay, the classic okay. race condition. The classic race condition is we have uh, a process A, and mm -hmm. you've got um, you've got a process A, and it knows that it's it's got the truth. Okay, and then you have B and C that are doing work uh, in parallel, but that work is initiated from some other thing. And we always assume that B is going to tell A, step one is complete, and then C is going to tell A, okay, step two is complete. And you cannot complete step two before you do step one, but they're operating independently. Now, let's say that B has a network call that it's got a block on, and that resource is down temporarily, so it waits, and C finishes before B. B and C are inherently in a race. And we expect that the race is always going to be completed with B winning the race mm -hmm. and then C being the second one to message A. But that order could be, that could happen out of order. Um, like out of order as regards our expectations. Okay. And in concurrent systems, this happens all the time where people have in their head like, um, oh, I'm going to start up Okay, so let's say, for example, I'm going to start up uh, the registry, and then I'm going to start up the clients, and then I'm going to open, and then I'm going to tell the clients to listen to the network, right? Now, when you're developing, that registry is really small, right? So loading it into memory is like instant. So the registry, the registry comes up, and then your client listening processes come up, and then you're listening on the network, and so you should be able to serve requests, right? No, not right. Because that registry may, if it becomes large, take a long time to load into memory. Maybe there's a bunch of state, maybe it's got a lot of intermediate state that it has to like pull off of oh, disk a perfect, and organize. Perfect example. Perfect example. Okay, I have a perfect example. I know exactly what you mean. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Right, the, so you're in a race the, now between like serving trash to the world until the registry is populated? Right. I, so um, an example was um, I had that stupid thing where I was popping up a window and the window would listen to events from the first thing. 
Yes. So like I had process A and process B, process A pops up and starts listening for events from process A. Mm -hmm. And I assumed, and, and, and process A, I said, pop up the window and then send it message X. And then in message B, I was never, in context B, I was never getting message X. And it turned out that I was assuming that, that between line N and line N plus one in process A, that process B would have enough time to spawn and start listening because I assumed that I was dealing with the same environment where like, because it, because just in my head, I'm assuming this is Erlang, but it's not. It's, it's. Yeah. And in Erlang, like it, you block until you get satanic. the PID back from a spawn call. So you know, it's there. Right. Right. And, and once that PID is back, you know that there's a mailbox there. Right. Yeah. You're not just shooting stuff off in a space. Right, which is kind of a, a stupid thing about J. Right, and this is another example of like, I mean, this is the thing with JS is like, it's not, it's not a language that was designed from the ground up, assuming it was going to be concurrent. So it doesn't have these assumptions like every process has a mailbox. Right. right? Yeah. 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 So exactly. So you've got this like, the process has to create a mailbox. And the mailbox only can listen to messages from certain contexts, blah, blah, blah. It's, so, it's just annoying. Right. And you're supposed to use some oopy nonsense to, like, manage the mailbox. Yeah. Yeah. And that's... So, like, you've got to spawn that process, and then because it doesn't have a discrete initialization function um, that'll give you a return, and then you get the PID out of it, it's got this, like... Um, You've got to spawn the process, and then once that's done, it's already returned. But then it's got to do a thing like register a callback handler. And that may not have been yeah. yet, so it might not even be listening to what you're going to send. So you solved yeah. it the way that very often people solve things, which is you sleep for a second to make sure it's got time to take care of it. Or you look well, that, over it until not... it responds. What I discovered is that there's a way for process A to inject code into process b and so i think that's what i'm going to do okay yeah right. and so, I, have, I haven't had time i haven't had time to like uh really experiment with that but that's that's probably what i'm going to do right yeah so that's that's kind of um actually what we want to do hang on i don't want to show you that yet um the ledger thing that's what i was doing yesterday your question was um what's a good way to like read a project to get a sense quickly mm. for what, like, why does anything do anything? How do you answer that question for yourself quickly? Um, so in this case, my approach, yeah, the, the word for that is quickly. Yeah. 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 Quickly so the, the, the quick way yeah. to do that for me is I find out what the, uh, app module is, which in this case is page right. itself. And I read that and I look for start. Mm -hmm. What's this? What do the start functions do? Okay, so these, I've got three start functions. I've got a start here, application start page, and I've got a port, a start port number one, which is kind of unique. And then start two is the actual application callback, right? So if I just did start mm -hmm. from the command line, it calls application start, and that's calling this with, right. with empty arguments, which is why they're blanked out because nobody ever. Well, you could use them, but it's that's like OTP, you know, kind of release type stuff. If you call it with arguments, it's a little bit different. The way that we do it with ZX is this arguments tends to be ignored. And then if you had command line arguments, the daemon has that and you can get you can there's a call ZX daemon quartz right. and it'll tell get you what, or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It tells you whatever. exactly what the yeah. what the um you know, the qualified arguments on the command line were. So anyway. Uh Okay, so we're starting some supporting applications, INETs, SSL, which actually, I think INETs is redundant if I'm doing intro started, and vanilla, and then, <clears throat> okay, AJ sop start link, so we're branching here. So this is when the thing really starts, right? So we got dependency started here, then we're really starting the thing. We've got children, Karen, rates, chain, ledger cache. yeah i always go to the top level supervisor that's that tends to be where yeah okay yeah, yeah. 
So Karen, right? We remember what Karen does, right? So that's the shit tester for Karen. Uh, Car- yeah, forms. that that generates like that generates the like is two plus two equal to four type thing. Right. It also does the hidden one uh, to prevent CSS. The hidden. Uh, okay. We'll, well, I'm sure we'll go look at that. So I. I yeah. So like, is that you, the when you put oh, cross site f- scripting, not not cascading style sheets? Yeah, yeah. yeah I know right, about right. that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, to make sure the that we CSRF. Have, yes, yeah, called? The, CSRF the CSRF forgery, kind of thing cross, where you have like a, a random token forgery. that they yeah. can't know about unless they're the ones that requested the page. So they can't just yeah. they can't yep. just post to that without having seen something from the server first. Yes, like okay. that's that's the basic idea is that you can't because get and post it's rest right. So you could just have somebody that's spamming a post endpoint with without ever having communicated with the server before. And if posting a form to that specific URL is like dangerous or could have random outcomes or whatever, then you want, it's a guarantee that somebody requested something from this site, saw that thing, and then is posting back to it within the time that you're giving. Mm -hmm. So, so Karen does both of those, both types of shit tests, um, CSRF and the, uh, um, so why is what is permanent fifty thirty versus brutal kill? What's the difference there? Fifty thirty? Where are you seeing fifty thirty? The the right the word after permanent. I might I'm it might not be five thousand. Yeah, it might just be that the font the because the okay it looks like fifty thirty with the way the video compression is, but five thousand is plausible. Okay, okay yeah, five thousand is is five seconds. This is how many milliseconds to wait for this to cleanly retire before it gets brutal killed. I see. Okay. So like, for example, um, rates is brutal kill because rates doesn't have to save anything. It doesn't keep like a database. Karen I see. has a little bit of persistence oh, between starts has... because we don't want, if the server went down between the time somebody made a request and it started back up again, and then they right. make a call, then it'll still work. Um, Ledger, uh, of course, has time to write, you know, persist before it goes down. Chain actually is going to change to, like, this is something I do in, like, a later phase of review, but may as well do it now. Um, Chain needs time to persist. Uh, Ledger needs time to persist. Cache doesn't, actually? Really? Yeah, 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 we can, we can kill that because it gets entirely at need. It doesn't matter. Right, it's entirely in memory. Yeah. Yeah. Um, media could do the same because I've moved all these around from before, so like I haven't really looked at the um, the the kill way here. Um, clients, yeah, we want that to take because we need the client manager to have time to like save everybody's whatever their updated state is before it goes down. Um, Okay, so that's all. So this is actually in order. Um, And now this is in order. I say in order. They're going to start up in this order, but they don't actually depend on each other. Um, Okay, sorry. A bunch of stuff in my mind is just clicking about why you do. Like I was going to ask why you were doing the uh, the um, fuck. What's it called? The pimps and hoes model. Um, What's the I guess we're in. um, What's it called? The client worker? The client, client, yeah, that, I was going to ask about why you were doing that, and then I started answering it in my head, and it started making sense. Okay. Because from from the standpoint of the top-level supervisor, it doesn't care about the details of how clients are handled. Right. It just knows that this is handling clients is a service. with clients. Yeah, clients is just a subservice. Right. And from the standpoint of the application, okay, that that's like your secretary. Like yeah. that, that person, that person's job is handling the clients and I don't care about any other details beyond that. Okay. Right. So, um, if we look at AJ, ooh. there are clients, this is a supervisor, right? And then it's mm-hmm. got the manager that's also permanent mm-hmm. 5,000 worker. And then the supervisor, uh, which this actually could be. I think if I want that to be brutal killer, I'm going to leave it like that. Um, what should happen here is it's going to tell its children. 
Oh, wow. So there's three levels of supervisors here, aren't there? Yeah. That's weird. Okay. Um, yeah, because you the client sup is actually... Um, because that's how you get duplicate uh, workers. Simple one for one. Mm. So that means that this supervisor is going to have an unbounded number of workers under it. Okay. And you don't want... <clears throat> Let me... I see. So the restart strategy is a, pro is a property of the supervisor... This, not yes. of the not of the process itself okay right yeah yeah so yeah life cycle management belongs to the supervisor so assuming that this is really up, important because i just i just got this like working again yesterday okay um, these are the type of like super important details that you would that you would have to fuck up many 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 times before you'd figure it out right uh, like exactly the right way to do it and Okay, so this is page right here that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. This is the like app supervisor from OTP land. And there's two layers of this here, and I forget which one does what, but like this is the way that OTP keeps an application like a, an, an application at arm's length. Is there's this little mm -hmm. like, like that's a supervisor, and then this is like a worker that knows there's a special kind of application supervisor. Then there's a supervisor from OTP, and then there's your supervisor. And that all keeps everything mm. at arm's length so that everything can blow up and it won't blow up like OTP. Um, yeah, I see. So AJ SUP, that was our. That's the one that we saw that had all these things defined, right? AJ Karen, ledger, media rates, chain, okay, and then the cache, right? AJ Clients is the subservice that handles client connections. And inside of that, we've got the client manager. And that's where, like, that's the process that also remembers what your username is and, like, what your public key is and shit like that, like what your login data is. So that's stateful. And it knows. So this is also the session keeper. When you log in, this thing maintains an ETS table of all the valid session keys. So your session mm. cookie, when you, when you send your session cookie in, and the client parses that, the client's making a lookup on the ETS table that the client manager owns to see if, if it's a valid session. If it's not, and the guy tries to log in, then based on his login credentials, whether it's a public key or a password or whatever, that's a call to the client manager and say, hey, I'm trying to log in, I'm trying to log in with these credentials. Can I log in yes or no? And the client manager will generate a new session key if it's valid put that in the ETS table and send it back to the caller so that he knows what to put in as the cookie. Okay. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. Why don't you have an AJ sessions as a top level service? I'm, I'm trying to, I'm just trying, let me figure. I guess you could, you could, yeah. it just like, it's just um, kind of conceptually. It makes sense. This is something that has to do with like clients. It's uh, okay. Yeah, you could, but say, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. It, it totally okay. can, and if we do this, if this becomes like multi-protocol, that will probably become the case. Mm. Right, because then it wouldn't just be AJ clients, it'd be like AJ HTTP clients. Yeah, right? yeah, it'd be like AJ HTTP as a service. AJ whatever. And then these would actually be oh, simplified. Yeah. The client manager's job in that case would be like super simple. It would really just be to manage the socket. Because he owns the socket, the listen socket. You can't have right. the children own the listen socket, right? Someone's got to own the listen socket. And the manager for that service is the right spot to put that. So, like, if you tell it, okay, we're not going to shut all existing connections down, but we're not going to listen on that port anymore, or we're going to change the port number, you could do all that live as long as you have a managing process that owns the socket. But all the... All of the session stuff, like what session's active at the moment, and um, remembering the client, like the user data, you know, the user registry and shit like that, that would go, that could become a separate service, and this would become AJ HTTP, and then like AJ native client, and AJ whatever, you know, it could be a whole different 
set of things. So you might have several subservices, one which each corresponds to a different protocol, right? Mm. Um, and then, yes, in that case, you're absolutely correct. You would have an AJ session somewhere here. And sessions would remember what the sessions are. It would know the usernames. Right. Like or it might be AJ users. Something something like that. Right. Um, but you're you're exactly correct. You would that would become a separation at the point that you choose we're supporting more than one protocol, which is no, or no, another no, like thing. another thing like or Karen could plausibly be handled entirely inside of AJ client man. Uh yeah, it could conceivably, yeah. Um, but that that would be okay. Yeah, it, it's just a ma it's a matter of like artistic choice almost. Okay. Yeah, yeah. This is kind of a code organization thing, but um, your intuition on that is exactly correct. the The client manager role, which would be the HTTP manager role, would be just to own the HTTP socket, and then the Telnet manager role would just be to own the Telnet management socket. It wouldn't need to know anything about clients themselves because you'd have a client service. That, that's like separate mm. from that and it would know the sessions shit and login passwords and the public keys and all that that registry would just move somewhere else but it but you know that yeah i mean you're completely right that this can be done somewhere else like half of this job can go somewhere else if you support more than one protocol um so this is just the way i've done it for now but if we do another protocol which might be good um in the future then yeah like if we write a native app like if we write an, so imagine if we write a native management app for like business owners and because they want to be able to sign a refund right there and they don't want to like go through a browser right. wallet. Well, writing a desktop mm. app that can ask this for the same data from this thing that you would see on the web makes a lot of sense. Well, now you've got two protocols and you know, right. Same thing with the JSON endpoint. Add a JSON endpoint to that. Well, we could do it. What most people do when they add a JSON endpoint is they actually add it all inside the same fucking HTTP interface. Um, but that kind of gets weird. That's not always what you want. Um, but that's what a lot of people do. But if you add a JSON endpoint, that's fundamentally a different protocol than interacting with the actual web as documents, right? It's it's saying like this is an abstract data interface, the serialization for which just happens to be JSON. Which is not mm. the same thing as saying I'm serving a website. Well, yeah, I mean, kind of though I, I was thinking about this, like the way that like the way cer certain individuals that we know um would would choose to design that quote native app, unquote would be to make an electron thing that would run, you know, entirely in react and to get data from the central server, it would just make JSON calls back home. Mm -hmm. And, and the thing is, unfortunately that would work. Um, yeah. See, so we've got our, why are there four? Because uh, these browsers, um, Firefox will always have a, a, the main session one that you're using, and then a, additional assets. If there are additional assets, it'll make another process to do those in parallel. And the uh, Chrome approach is to start with one socket, and then as additional resources are needed, it'll open new ones. It'll open new connections. Um, but the crazy thing with Chrome is that if anything fails, it will suddenly spawn like 10 processes at one time to hit That's the exact right. same endpoint. Because it's assuming I just, that I, everything's broken all the time and I eventually would, one of them will succeed. I, I remember that. Yeah, this. I mean, it, it's kind of strange. The basic assumption like if it, in the web is that everything is always broken. Right. And the thing is, that's not a wrong assumption. Like everything is broken all the time. <laughs> yeah. and, like that's the whole premise of lava mode is that like every is that all of this code is malicious but we're going to run it anyway and yeah right so how do we insulate gonna, ourselves and, and from a, it in a context where we're handling people's money yeah and exactly it's yeah just, it's scary right so anyway the, anyway right, this just, is the uh this was the original listener this which has become the new connection to chrome the first one 
and then these are the next two connections, which are Firefox. And there may have been intermediates in here too, like Chrome will spawn a whole bunch of connections and then kill them all off. Like to get images and shit, which I think is probably why these PID numbers are so much different. Mm. So, oh, I see. So one of your windows is Chrome or Chromium or whatever. I yeah, see. yeah, it's yeah Chromium, and so it'll do, um, the, the Chrome. Ah, uh, see now time has lapsed, and Firefox is actually keeping the session open because it wants to try to reuse the TC the single TCP connection. It's really good about that. Like whatever the main one is, that's actually showing you the page, so that you can do like multiple form submits back and forth, and the server doesn't have to do the work of opening new TCP connections, and you can keep that single session going until the until it gets messed up. Firefox is actually really polite about that. Um, Chrome spams a new connection per like whatever. What are the resources trying to get? Um, and oh, then after right. a couple seconds, mm -hmm. it'll be like, okay, well, I don't want to see that anymore. Well, and it, you know, let's, let's the thing bonk out. So anyway, th like if I, if I click around on stuff, yeah, this is our, so this is like registration. If you, what I'd clicked back here was this register. Register. Yeah. So to register, you have to have a public key. So the way I'm doing it right now is you just register and you have to have like the wallet will do its thing. Um, right. Okay. Just to get this to work at all. Uh, and that'll start you with a business. So, so what I was mm -hmm. messing with like um, some, uh, wait, some guy, some, some business ink address, one to three somewhere. Wow. Spelled very specially. Some email. And then, uh, okay, cool. So, and right now the currencies are these four, or well, five actually, um, that you might be stating as primary. Like, this is basically picking what the list currency is that your accounting system is going to be expecting. So, the recommended amount of AE is going to be based on the rates that you get from, like, from whichever currency you pick. And this is, of course, a Japanese thing. So, it's like, Yen is the considered primary. So this is just a test thing to so that I could get the formatting of like tables to even work at all. That's all that is in here. Um, like these aren't actual transactions, of course. But um, anyway, that's so, so back 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 up. What what is all that data I was looking at? Oh, timestamp. Okay, these are fake. Yeah, these are fake, fake. trans. Okay. I was playing with the okay. tape because like. This is actually, people say, don't use tables in HTML, but it's like, this is literally tabular data. So well, um, tables are the correct way to go, not a whole shitload of divs. Um, and I hadn't done table formatting forever, so I was playing with CSS to get it to look like a table. Yeah, I mean... Because um, by default, tables I, no longer look like tables, by the way. Yeah, I, I didn't, I haven't played around with that. Um I, I did play around with that for because I, I was using tables, but then tables weren't a good. I don't know, man. I haven't done um, HTML5. It has so many tags now. Like, yeah. Because what they did is they created a bunch of aliases to be, quote, semantic, unquote, instead of just having everything have one name. Now everything has 10. Mm -hmm. and well, so the, it, the big difference when it comes to, like, layout where the div div concept this division of the screen they tried to they they kind of learned something from the way that window managers like wx do things where there's like a kind of unified concept of of zones and they can be nested um and then you take from that the cascading style sheet idea is that child members inherit style from the parent right um that gives you a more powerful way to position things but then it's like they went from that and they decided instead of using sort of more standard language they made up all their own stuff so it's confusing if you're do if you're a GUI programmer <laughs> to figure out what stuff means what the effect of things is going to be um inside of a page when you use this um 
but the divs are absolute like all this stuff up here is divs right um for layout divs are vastly superior to the old way which was to use tables like invisible tables to force things to be arranged mm. a certain way um and so tables are not cool anymore but they're only not cool in the context of doing layout if you actually have a table of data to show like a list of transactions then you should use a table mm -hmm. um and so okay that's obvious easy to understand but i had not actually written table shit for like years um and when i tried to do it like i remembered what they were like the the table header and you know the the table td i don't know why it's called td but the little cells each individual cell of data is it called table division or i don't it's just td maybe to maybe me. the word for cell in french starts with a d or something yeah that's, that's the type of thing that would happen <laughs> something like that um like it seems like it would be called cell but it's not called cell um anyway so I did this and then it didn't look like a table. There was no, like all the borders were all messed up and everything was weird. And so I was playing with the CSS to figure out how to do that. And last night I got it to look kind of sort of okay. Um, by ripping off my own CSS from the, um, from the CX documentation, I just like opened that up and I saw, Oh, I have a table that looks right in there. Um, so anyway, so, so this is fake data, uh, that I'll populate later. Um, anyway, the point with this being that I can register now and it remembers who I am and I can log out and log back in again. Um, wait, not path. Yeah, no, not password log. I haven't done password login yet. So it's just saying you would be logging in now. Uh, login is the same way that you remember from Agora. And it gets us to the right screen. So like we're remembering users, the basic mechanic works. Yay. Okay. Um, and the uh, anonymous, you can pay Anani Mouse. Mm -hmm. And this part, you need a good, um, you need a, a key, which, where's the thingy? I should be able to copy. Copy from the wallet, and then... Are you able to Ooh. pay yourself? Uh, you can. You can actually send a payment to yourself. You just pay like a gas fee to get it to go. Right. So you just lose money. <laughs> yeah. You. So you what just happened? Pay a miner. Thanks for mining this on the chain. Um. Anyway, so that I need to. You could. You can. You. You could conceivably imagine some business whose entire business revolves around like somehow paying themselves spend transactions just over and over and like verifying that miners mind it. And that would be some, somehow. That's what the, there's some that's what the eternity checker does right now. Like right. there's a, there's a, um, there's some utility that just um, measures like how fast transactions are through the mempool. And all it does is uh, like every second or something, it sends itself like 2000 edos. And it's so it's paying some gas fee, like every couple seconds or whatever. And you'll see these things on the in the log. It's like random micro blocks that just have one transaction in them, and it's just like this one account sending itself something. Um, and with gas fees the way they are right now, that can go on for probably like years <laughs> without depleting that account. It only has like I don't know. AE and it's not even much of anything but um anyway that's actually a function is to like measure the speed of a chain you send yourself a transaction and see how fast it gets mined um, right so anyway anyway so you you can see what this turn what this uh um supervision structure what it turns into right mm -hmm. you've got all your primary services at the top and then the client's service is the one at the moment it's the only one that's like nested to do a thing um so, getting back to the startup routine, right? Over here. We just saw mm -hmm. what AJ SUP does is it creates this, this nested structure of processes that is the services that we want, right? Then we, we ask for configuration. And configuration, ah, uh, here's the one. 
Remember ZX Demon RV? Yeah. Okay, so it asks ZX Demon RV, and if it gets a single argument, then that argument is expected to be a path to a configuration file. If not, um, if there's no arguments, then it's conf.eterms. And the path to that file will be in the etc directory for page in under the zomp like world, right? So it's going to be zomp slash etc slash otbr page, something like that. Um, and there'll be a configuration file there. <coughs> Then we check that the file exists. If it does, then we do file consult path on it and we get the settings out. Uh, or that blows up because it's the bad file and that's a good spot to blow up. You don't want to start up on shit, right? Um, mm -hmm. And if not, then the configuration data is just empty. And so I use the old school prop lists get value here with a default, with defaults defined back here. So this address at this port is the testnet uh, backend. And okay, so there's a there's one the, the one global thing that happens here that matters is um, we want to know the testnet. We want to know what the if we're on mainnet or testnet, and we want to know uh, what the the build is and there's actually there's one more there's three things that go into global state at the runtime level which is the network id whether we're on testnet or mainnet um and that like if you look in, at agora you can see this so this is mainnet right and every time we hit this page it's got to know that so we want this to be a fast global lookup it's not changing ever after startup um and testnet so the distinction between these two is defined by that configuration file at runtime. In addition to that, like uh, one consequence, let me switch that for me. Um, one consequence of that is that when we look at an item, the URL for the explorer is different, depending on whether it's testnet or mainnet. So there's a couple of things in terms of page construction to change based on whether it's testnet or not. And those things get checked all the time. And they're it's a global thing that never changes after the, the time you start up. So um, persistent That's term, interesting. Yeah, persistent term is, I'm, a, I'm is, just a, trying to... is a super fast way to have global lookups, but you should not ever, not ever, but you should almost never be changing anything that's in here. It's a slow to update, very fast concurrent read. Uh, What's the difference between that and um, ETS with the settings optimized for reading but not writing? It's even it's even faster to read and it's even more destructive to try to update. I see. Okay. Like this is as optimized as you can get to for a global read. But okay, you don't want to try to change data in here regularly. Um, the garbage collection is... for this is fucking like a nightmare. You don't want to deal like this is really, really as far into the into the realm of like I want to be able to read this data, and we basically assume it's static data. So we don't have a fast mm. rebuild. There's no way to like garbage collect these terms efficiently. There's no way to. Like we have no performance guarantees uh, with regard to rebuilding the index if we change change the value of an item versus adding an item. Adding an item is easy. Changing the value of an existing item is expensive. In this one, I see. And ETS, it has, almost has to. ETS is more like a map. I see. It's like a global map. So, and ETS has got concurrent rights now too. There's like ways to do like. Uh, locking that like they've got a good locking thing so you can do concurrent read and concurrent write um i don't like that because the way that i use ets tends to depend on sequence a lot 
then I want the process that owns these tables to block as it updates everything. So it, it's more atomic, you know, for the readers. Um, so I, I just, I don't like global write, but uh, it's possible. I just don't, I don't, I prefer to design a system that doesn't need that at all. Like find a way to not need that, generally speaking. Um, which I mean, I don't mind global write if you have local read, but I either want optimized for global read or optimized for global write. But the other side of that, the read, if I've got global write, I don't want a global read. If I have a global read, if I have a global read, then I don't want a global write. Um, pick one or the other. And that actually that constrains your thinking down to just designing better systems anyway. Um, but I like that constraint. It helps me mentally and it makes the systems way less crazy when it comes to debugging. later. Anyway, which network we're on, mainnet or testnet, is told to the system at the outset. That never changes. Um, the build, that's like the build number, that is also told at the outset, never changes. There is one additional magical thing here, which is uh, maintenance mode. There's normal mode. So uh, this is these are still Agora. This is the artifacts left over. This should be page or whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, but the mode that we're in is normal or maintenance. And there are certain cases where uh, when we're in maintenance mode, everything becomes read only. So if you have if you post something to a process that's supposed to like update the registry, any kind of registry, and it'll check if we're in maintenance mode before it updates. And if we're in I maintenance see. mode, then no, that was read only. We're going to bypass that. And before we go to maintenance mode, we persist. The reason for this is so that we can do like broad sweeping changes. So like, let's say that this was written originally for Agora, right? Um, mm -hmm. In the case that Agora is getting a lot of traffic and we want to do a large update to Agora. What we're going to want to do is take the database from Agora and snapshot it, populate it in a private mm -hmm. server, test it and see if the updates are fucked up or not. Because maybe it's fine on our test data, but we just built that test data. We need to take existing data with whatever may be right or wrong about it and make sure it works on the new code, right? So, like, especially if we have one of those uh, state updates. Remember, like, the version, the internal state record may have changed. So we have to have that map oh, from version 1 right, to version right, 2. Right, right. We want to be able to test run that. Well, to get a snapshot, though, snapshot, right? You can't just go copy those files because while you're copying them, they might be getting written to. So right, so you gotta. So you go to maintenance mode. You've got to have for, a frozen. Yeah. Right. So you go to maintenance mode, which shows up on the main page. It says, "Oh, whoa, we're in maintenance mode." It says it. Um, and then you copy the files, and then you go back to normal mode. Well, copying that that might take one second. Probably nobody will notice it. But it was important that we're able to do that, right? Then, when you do do the switch, you go into maintenance mode. We would have, well, I'd start a second Agora instance on a new port, right? I'd put this in the maintenance mode. Mm -hmm. Start the new one on a new port. So it's listing on a new port. Then change the prox the reverse proxy, like the load balancer, to point to this. That's the new live one. Then I would shut this one down. But I have to be able to put it in the maintenance mode before I do that switch, because they're both going to be reading from the same files, the same data, like on the same on disk data. They're both pointing at it, right? Mm -hmm. So this one's got to be rendered safe first. Then start this one up on a new port, then change the proxy, then shut this one down. And that's a graceful transition to the new thing. So that's what maintenance mode is for, is literally maintenance. Makes so, sense. So this is a thing that you do need to have. Uh, it's just not, it's not something that's always obvious when you're, you know, 
the word the spelling of the word maintenance is like the word receive to me it just it just does not it can't look that right either. even if you spell it yeah. right or you flip it around the wrong way both of them feel equally wrong and you go but and then you overthink it and now it all looks wrong right and then if you do it enough all english looks wrong oh god every word starts god i hate i i hate when you like uh say a word enough and then it just starts to sound like some random noise and then <laughs> and and then you start thinking about like web that's such a weird word web yeah web my sister web. and i used to find words like this that would like drive each other crazy and her favorite one and this one worked really good was the word hominy like the food hominy okay. if you say hominy enough times you start thinking about words that are close to hominy but not and then you're like every word even remotely close to hominy is about sounds has nothing to do with food at all how the fuck did i become a food word? um um hominy um uh, harmony it, yeah yeah fuck it, it, fuck yeah. and so like then you're like okay why is this a word this is a dumb word um and anyway she was good at do like on sunday like going to church or something right where you're just gonna be sitting in like a fucking quiet room for a while she like on the way there she like plant these little fucking grenades in my brain knowing it was gonna mess with me and uh so i'd, I'd like try to get <laughs> i'd get back at her and so i'd start speaking like just phonetically like you know i can know you had softball yesterday and she would she, and she'd just be like oh and it'd drive her nuts because then everything after that, like knitting and, you know, oh yeah, any kind of like silent K, you know, give me the knife, uh, or give me the knife, and anyway, yeah, that's that's one of those. Knife sounds like the name of a rapper. It does. That's what's fun about like some of these. You can come up with like dude, that's that should be my stage name, Knife. Um, Lil Hominy also sounds like the name of a rapper. <laughs> Lil Hominy. That's terrible. I do like the um you know the Lil Hominy, that would that would be that would be the name of like a, that would be like a Mexican rapper, right? It would be one of those like ambiguously ethnic ones. Oh right, right. So like you can't tell anymore. Like it's just you just you only know that they're like really American or maybe French. Um anyway, the uh so you remember how this starts, right? This is a client process. Yeah, uh, vaguely. This guy. Who, yeah. Nameless, right? Um, okay. So this starts with a listen socket. Let me get the uh, client man. So listen, the listen instruction. I didn't finish what I was saying earlier. So the configuration that I just showed you. Okay, yeah. Configuration happens, uh, and then based on that configuration, these three things, we tell Vanilla what the network ID it should be expecting is, which doesn't actually have an impact right now, but I should make it so that, like, I should actually probably set the net ID from the node that you connect to, like, call status the first time, then pull it off, because that can be done automatically. I just didn't, I didn't think about that uh, when I wrote this. Um, anyway, A nodes, this cannot be skipped. You have to give it uh, a list of nodes, right, to be connected to. Um, and then listen. Listen port blah. Uh, all this is is an alias to calling AJ client manager listen port number. Is that. So what happens over here is that's a call to do listen. Okay, here we go. In the case that we don't have a port number set, these are our socket options. We're listening on INET 6, which listens on 4 and 6 both. So it's kind of easier to just use. Uh, we do really easy gen TCP listen on the provided port number with the socket options that are just defined here. Um, so that to do, that looks like, I'm, I'm guessing we have Nginx do that now. Yeah, actually, yeah, I don't need that. Um, yeah, yeah. So this was the like, 
make super special was going to be the function that elevates that from TCP to TLS. I actually don't need to do that anymore. So yes, that's just an old to do that doesn't apply because uh, we fix that with infrastructure. Does, does using Nginx have any, I mean, not for us, but like, how much of a performance cost is Nginx? Uh, it's a, it's a slight one in terms of like routing. The biggest performance cost that Nginx entails is that you cannot keep, um, you can't remember, I told you Firefox is really polite trying to keep the same session open on the, at least the user's view, like the background artifacts, it does some stuff with process things that happen in the background, but the, the connection that actually showed you the page, the first one that made the request. It tries to keep that one alive with mm. the server for a long time so that you can mm. reuse it over and over and have this like back and forth conversation with the server. Um, mm -hmm. That cannot have, I actually optimized Agora for that originally. Right. It was for that persistent connection. Nginx as a reverse proxy actually winds up breaking that because every time a request goes back out from Nginx, it goes and cuts the connection. Um, I think there's a setting that you can change that, but I, there I, may I be, I, I saw one that they can do, um, HTTP two, uh, the streams from HTTP two, and they can do web sockets now through Nginx as a reverse proxy. There's settings for that, but I didn't look into what I'm not doing web sockets with this right now. Um, so I didn't go into detail with it, but out of the box, you don't get persistent connections um, over HTTP 1.1 with Nginx reverse proxy. And getting it to do it, I hear there's a way to do it, but there's also like a security problem with it um, where it can, it can wind up mapping a current session to like the wrong external thing. I, I didn't get into the details with it because I was like, okay, well, that sucks, whatever. I don't care. I'll just make the, the thing was the session table here in client man was not ETS originally. The, uh, the session table was originally a thing was just in client man's state. And you sent a call to get, to check whether or not a session was valid or not. Right. So it was a call. The, either the overhead was a call. Um, as long as you're not spamming that call, every single view, right? Every page of you, then it doesn't matter. Mm. But when you put Nginx as reverse proxy, now you actually are spamming that call every single page of you. Um, if you're logged in, if you're not logged in, it never touches anything because you don't have a, you don't have a session cookie to begin with. Um, but if you have a session cookie and you're going through this, like if you have a robot that's logged in and it's going through the site really quick, it's crawling the site, um, it would spam the shit out of the client manager as originally designed. So this one changes that and it's ETS now. So uh, when you look up, let's see. Sorry, so weird. What's hey, that? my audio is fixed. Oh. I don't know if you're saying something, but uh, it's just like. Yes, I'm saying yeah, a whole Discord. bunch. We're doing sort of like a, a walkthrough to explain how page works at all. Um, oh, okay. So yeah, the session lookups now are a global read. So we do a session, I, you check session, uh, and it will return the user populated for you or an error if the session's not valid. You send session ID in, uh, get a timestamp. So what the timestamp is for is if the time is expired, then we would want to clean up, uh, clean up that session, remove it from the table. Um, anyway, the typical path is that you look up that session ID, it pulls a user out and you just send the user back to the, you know, back to the caller. And that's the, like, that's the whole thing. Um, if you get a, but that's only when the expiry date is still in the future. This probably actually, this sh really should be a call. This should be a kill session call down to the, uh... yeah, see, I really shouldn't have a client pro, this is still in the context of the client process. I should actually, I'm gonna make it to do to myself here. 
Um, so, yeah. So this should be a call here to be like, um, um, It should be something like this. Um, and then, yeah, so all this shit here should actually happen inside of the client manager, um, which I mean, I can implement that right now if you guys don't mind watching. I am like in the middle of. Go ahead. Okay, handle cast sweep. Okay, do sweep. Oh, handle cast. I don't know if we're going to have a new state or not, but I'm going to start. I'm going to start out thinking that way. And then maybe. What happened to do sweet? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Sessions, Durka Durka. Rick Grimes, is this, this is a cultural reference from before my time, I'm guessing. Oh, Rick, yeah, he's the, uh, he was the main character in the original Walking Dead. Okay, I thought that was a joke about um, Elon's girlfriend, but never mind. No, 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 no. This is a zombie. So the Rick Grimes now returns a process that we're calling zombie control. And what it does is it goes through and finds stale sessions and kills them. Like all the zombified sessions that would be taken out. For the, the what about his brother? What's that? What about his brother? Oh, I don't know. I never read the comic. Isn't that from Walking Dead? Yeah, but I, he doesn't have a brother in Walking Dead. He has a uh, he has a partner, a friend, the police that Walking like on, right. yeah tried to like fuck his wife and then everything. Mm -hmm. went. So that never works out good. Fucking people's wives that aren't yours, it's not not a good thing. Um, oh, let's see. I'm gonna have a new session. Sure. I think that's just a list, right? Yeah, yeah. Session is just a list of these records, so I should be able to kill it by the SID, which that's easy. Let me do that up here. Okay, new sessions. It's going to equal lists, key, delete, SID, session, SID, sessions. Okay, so that's done. And then we kill that from there. Okay, that's done. Then, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. let's see, persistent term, AJ next sweep. No, we want the actual sweep, sweepy thing. To, oh, ooh, I actually called sweep in here. I'm not, I'm not going to do sweep. So if you try to log in with a dead session, then it just goes away. Um, and that's it. I'm not going to fucking... We've already got a sweepy thing that happens. Let's see. Sweep. Um. No, I guess we should probably sweep.
So if we do that, Sweep is already like a global session kill. Let me see. And it gets rid of the whole thing. Yeah. You know what? I'll get... um, I'm just going to cheat. And this is going to be... I already wrote this. And then, like, I was probably just tired when I wrote this. Um, yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to keep, I'm just going to do a sweep, and that may be too expensive, and I will find out later if it's too expensive. Like, if I see these giant fucking utilization spikes in logs, then, okay, it's time to make that more efficient. Um, but for right now, that's good enough. Anyway. So that's handy. Um, so sweep already exists, and it's going to call sweep, and sweep does the Rick Grimes thing, and Rick Grimes has already written to do exactly what I want, which is uh, do this. Like it parses over the sessions log, and any dead set it kills the old sessions, keeps the live ones, and pulls the ones out of ETS that shouldn't be there. And it and this will be called if an expired session actually tries to log in. So that's good enough for me. Yay. <coughs> because the thing like the thing is if this gets called once by someone logging in, and then these are all reaped already, the next guy calling in, like logging in with another expired session, that session will have already been pulled out, right? So it won't be called twice, like needlessly. Um and that, so I'm just not going to use a timer at all. There's no, there's no good reason to do that. Um, so that is that. Anyway, so listen socket. Uh, when we start up, we have listen socket. Uh, we start out with listen. We block on TCP accept. When we get a new connection, we start our successor and we're just, this is the PID of the new of the successor, but to us, we don't care. The supervisor is going to have it. We just don't care what it is. Um, we get the peer name so we can do the so we can know what the peer is. If calling peer name bonks, which has actually happened before, I've there's been a couple of cases where somebody opens a TCP connection. And before we can even ask the socket what the peer name is, it's already closed. Like that's yeah, crazy. That dealing with Chrome. Uh, I think so. And it the thing is, it happens with like actual. I thought that could only happen inside the firewall, just because of like the delay, network delay. But I've actually had that happen with like live traffic from the inner tubes. So I'm catching that case, and occasionally, this will show up in logs. Socket miraculously closed before we could even get the peer name. And then it closes and I put the error, like I print the error in it just because it's crazy. And then that process terminates. Its successor's already going, so it doesn't matter. Um, it's just amazing that that can happen that quick. Uh, it's not normally a thing you would even code against. You would just get a crash here once every year or something. But with web stuff, you'll get a crash. You'll get this will get hit like once a day just from bots crawling the, the site. Um, some of them are written in a crazy way. So this is our receive loop for... Oh, yeah, right. Here's another one. So when you set options, if that socket's already dead, you will get error Einval. So every time you call set ops, you actually need to catch whether or not the set ops actually worked. So loop two is the expected receive loop. And... The setups step of that is broken out as its own as its own function, specifically because I want to catch if setups even worked. If it didn't, I'm going to go ahead and exit. Um, these aren't connections that you care like. If these connections terminate fucking randomly, then you go okay, whatever, and then close it. Um, but there's no I'm not logging. 
these exits or anything. I log the weird ones, the abnormal ones. Um, and then because I have the, uh, I'm using um, ProcLab to, these are, these are raw processes. This is not a gen server. This is a raw process, but I'm complying with the ProcLab expected system messages. So the system callbacks that are supposed to exist do. And that means that I can inspect these processes at runtime. Like I can get their state out and all the weird system, all the sys library stuff that you can do to inspect your system at runtime. I can still call, even though this is not a gen server, a gen whatever. Um, but that this is like the way you have to get it started is to do, you know, you have to comply with, with that, that system, the OTP kind of lower level. Um, anyway, this is the handle. So if we get a mess, a normal TCP trafficking from this, then we go to handle, uh, then if it's, so if we get traffic, we're checking, make sure that we don't have like these weird, no, no continuations and error cases. Um, if we have the received, you know, the, the, we've gotten traffic in, um, we're printing the traffic that we receive right now, which you can see here, stuff like that. And that's just for debugging. This, um, this normally doesn't happen, this thing. Um, this is, but again, this is for, for debugging pretty much. That's what the IO format call is. Um, parse, parses the request, and then we dispatch. Do you remember this Epstein, the dispatch thing? Um, let me look. Sorry. So we are in AJ client. Mm -hmm. New state. Okay. Handle. So handle. Okay. Wait, let, let, let back up. What is handle? That's right here. So the, so loop two, we've set to listen. Okay. To so, ones. so, so this is when we are talking to a web browser. Okay. Yes. Hand. So we got we got some nonsense from the web browser. Mm -hmm. Okay. So handle state in the message. Okay. Mm -hmm. And either we're going to get back okay and a new state, in which case we go back to the top of the loop, or we fuck off. Okay. So handle. Okay. Either we don't have any data, in which case this is like Chrome fucking with us. Okay. Or we have well, an or it error. Could be, this could be the end of a complete message too. Okay. Yeah. Whatever. Okay. So handle some data. Okay. Format characters to. Why are you doing characters to list of received? Hmm? For a couple of reasons. One to ease parsing. Okay. Okay. So I can parse a list of uh, I can parse a list of actual Unicode characters instead of code point or instead of bytes, because the UTF eight bytes can be spread over several, like a UTF character oh. one code point can be a lot of bytes. So it's that easier. Makes sense. Okay. It's easier to just like go over the actual UTF eight after it's translated to code points than trying to deal with it in binary. All right. This again. Again, I ask why we tolerate anything other than ASCII, but we, we can have that conversation later. Um, okay, new state and next. That's case of parse. Okay. S okay, new state is users, new user, result, and next. Okay, so the, the, okay. So we're going to parse the request. Okay, and I assume that's just an HTTP parse. Okay. That's right. And so this either is the empty, empty request to start with, and if it comes right, back... Right, that's, that's, that's an accumulator that you're sending in. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, request, what is more? It means that we got two requests and they're stuck together. And so one oh, request ended and there's more stuff going. That's kind of what this was about, none. Okay. I see. 
Oh, okay. That's that's what happens down here. Is this actually? Oh, uh, okay. So none is a is possibly a value you're generating. I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. Next state is state of user check session. Yes, this is the complicated okay. one where the user. This will probably start out as user with like none, empty. After we've parsed this, though, the request may have a session cookie in it. In which case, okay, and that's where we're, we ETS that's look where up we have, AJ sessions and actually pluck out a populated user instead of active. That's where we have the AIDS equals dead thing. Okay, right. Um, dispatch. Right. right, let me scroll this down a little bit. Right, okay. yeah, check sessions. So check sessions request yeah. an user, and what we're doing is pulling the cookies out. And we're checking the language based on cookies. Remember, this is where I added the headers to check the automatic language thing? Mm, I vaguely remember that we had some sort of issue with this, but I don't I don't remember the net. The I had except it. language. Oh, the capitalization capital. was different. Yeah. And so I I now lowercase everything in headers to make that match. That's that's right. That's right. Like that um like Different browsers do the capitalization differently or some shit like that. Yes. I can't remember. The yeah, they literally, it's awesome. There's kind of an accepted standard now of cap, like doing title case, but they don't all follow let that. Me, let, me, let me just quickly, I'm, I'm looking through the code on my screen as well. Um, retarded HTML date. Is that, what's it called? Oh, ridiculous HTTP date or something like that? Yes, yes, ridiculous web date. I'm I'm surprised you didn't call it retarded web date. It's ridiculous web. I think date, other yeah. things are called retarded, but yeah. No, I searched retarded and there were no results. I'm I'm very proud wow. of you for your. I did good. For your sensitivity. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah, ridiculous web date. That's quite a. Oh, the ridiculous bullshit fixed with <laughs> garbage. <laughs> I, I love the I love the name. That's like the type of thing I would name a function, like a function that's like <laughs> the, the name is a sentence. Yeah, ridiculous. Which, well, that's which a is long fun, which, function name. Ridiculous bullshit fixed which fixed with garbage. Somebody or, or it would be someone's not gonna or, know that that's a thing, and they're gonna be oh. looking through like the they're gonna go into the atoms table and like observer someday. And they'll be like, oh, I wonder what atoms are in this system. What a neat sit Ridiculous bullshit. Fixed with garbage. What the... F <laughs> it's going to be... Ridiculous web... And it's right next to ridiculous web date. Right. <laughs> so... And then they're going to look up the... And, and then and then they're going to... They're going to see go Favicon the shit. They're going and to go through the unfortunate, exp unfortunate experience of trying to read the HTTP standard. And... And then, yeah. yeah. I remember... Yeah. Then they're going to realize remember, why I was annoyed. Dude, I remember... Dude, the the web. I mean, uh, but let's keep it I, family I doing... friendly because this is being published. Right. Okay. This is not just us. Fam I'm not going to edit this. Family friendly. Okay. Family friendly. All right. So parse. parse. Socket receives request of. Okay. It's the world wild web. The world wrong. The wild shit. The yes, it's, it's, the, it's the wildly <laughs> wrong <laughs> web. <laughs> wildly wacko. That's a world wacko web. The really silly web. Oh, right. So, look, if ID is not none, that means that we're actually in a persistent connection. Because that means this. Hmm? Like the first time. So, remember that persistent connection case? Mm -hmm. The first time that you open that connection, it might have retrieved a session. So the user's populated now, right? But if mm -hmm. the ID is not none, we just bypass that whole check because we've already got a user. Oh, I see. Okay. Because you may be just handling iterative requests on the same user. You don't need to log in again. Oh... So I'm checks, trying to think of a way that that would create a bug, but there's no like as long as your authentication is correct, there's no way. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's why there's that's, no that's way, why there's, sessions there's, are, 
it, it because now you've like actually got a session inside of what was supposed to be a sessionless protocol by creating this thing of like successive within oh session my God. connections you do don't you that's yeah. so stupid right oh my god but, but you're allowed to just web blow that up at any moment they did this for efficiency reasons um but that's again oh though that's god. why having a reverse proxy that might accidentally cross the streams becomes dangerous because then you could have a mistake dude the um it's crazy how much of how much of the web would just be simpler if they replace the word may with must in every, like every instance of every protocol, <clears throat> just replace the word may with must and or must like, not. There's a lot of yes, optional yeah, yeah, yeah. trash that you could just remove. Right. And then the only time it isn't optional is like stuff like the date format. And it's just <laughs> <laughs> the date format. So fun. It's like we have, we, we have an RFC we have that's got a nice RFC little like sorts correctly year month day time in similar order right um where you've got the significant numbers coming first so they all sort very simply it's all regular it's just numbers mm -hmm. everyone knows what the size is every system can produce these numbers and they just no we want oh i like this too like we're going to be international oh. utf8 but we're going to use english only like text abbreviations yes 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 stuff. yes i mean that's that's i mean and then well and then other like in japan you have your own calendar system that you use that's different from the christian calendar right mm -hmm. yeah i mean it's just and then and in india yeah, yeah and I like mean, we don't but, mind using like, the gregorian one it's just that it's kind of nice when it's when it works out in a regular way that's like computer friendly where you go like oh mm. to, like look down here at the bottom bottom right of my screen this is 2023 ninth month 22nd day and then it does say king yobi like friday like that's you know a nice little thing to know that it's friday but if that, you sort that right that ordering automatically sorts itself on its own and if you just replace this with dashes and make everything double width like correctly then yeah so you're fine i have mine I have mine formatted to the ISO date, although I've kind of. So I don't the know. reason I'm that sorry. I wrote that this is a ridiculous bullshit fixed width garbage is that I'm going to the trouble of making this fixed width, which would be important if I was doing ISO dates, right? Yes. However, yeah. Look what comes first here. The English letter right, day the abbreviation. Day. You can't sort this for shit already. Yes. So it's already dumb. Like, why do you care about fixed with whatever? It's stupid. Well, you can sort. So like all of the Monday requests come first and then wait, no, no, no. It wouldn't even be that. It would be what, what's the first alpha, all the Friday requests <coughs> first. And then, um, yeah. and then let's see all the Monday requests mm -hmm. and then all the Thursday requests and then all the Tuesday requests. Oh, wait, no, no, no. So S comes before T. So it'd be all the Saturday, all the Sunday. Yeah. Right. All the twos, all the Thursday, all the Tuesday, and all the Wednesday. Right. Oh God, I just love. Oh man. And the months is like a whole nother like realm of weirdness if you want to alphabetically sort them. It does. It just doesn't make any sense. And the the ISO dates follow the way that we would do it in Japan anyway, and it's just easier. Mm. Um. Yeah, it's just easier. Oh, I like how this is telling me Mountain Standard Time is actually a day behind, and it tells me that like explicitly. Um, that's kind of nice. Anyway, date stamp time. The the thing is, is that timestamps were a solved problem long before the web standard came out, and they just decided to like. They just did it wrong for no reason. It's spite. I am convinced just... it's spite. They just don't like us. No, the reason there is a reason. The reason is to make. The web devs uh, debugging sessions easier because <laughs> you know just want to read the date when they send those requests. How hard is it to read two thousand two zero two three dash zero nine dash two one? How how hard yeah. is that to read? Well, the, apparently, the like... it doesn't it's not it doesn't include it does not I guess it's not 
Like write a parser for this. <laughs> been lying, but... <laughs> like in your head, just write a parser for this compared to the ISO dates. It's ridiculous. Um, but that's what they did. So okay. Anyway, I, I do it. I comply with their stupid shit. Um, oh, and uh, the the best you part want to is rationalize it. I guess that's what you would think. The browser doesn't even enforce compliance with this, even though it's in theory required. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The standard says this is required, but then the browsers don't actually care. And actually, this thing here, the fixed width deal, didn't matter to any of the browsers. It was some. There was some tool I was using, to like check the output. And it was barfing oh, on this. I don't remember what it was. I think it might have been. I remember. Might be remembering something else. It was. So, it was some. Uh, no, I. I don't remember. I, I. I. My brain is firing and pointing at something, but it's pointing at a very vague memory, and I don't remember enough details, and I don't think it has anything to do with this. Anyway. It so might have, it might have been one of the bad. things that Arch found when he was like trying to kill. Oh. He was trying really hard to like kill Agora, and he found all these weird holes in it. And I went and fixed a lot of them. Um, and this was right. Uh, this might have been one of them where he's like, "My tooling is barfing on this one thing. This is a weird, rea weird response or something." Um, it might have been that he, because he's the one that made me like finally do the cross site scripting one with the uh, Karen. Oh right. Ooh, ooh. Um, CSRF or whatever it's called. Uh, he's the one that got me to go ahead and get that to do a specific, like work a specific way. Um, cause he, cause he's like, he knows all that stuff. That's really in his head. So it was really good to talk with him and having him attack Agora a bunch of times was that for me, man, that was awesome. Um, and it, it was surprising how it was motivating too. It's fun. <laughs> it was motiv. Well, it was, it was nice. It was, surprising how few vulnerabilities there were and they were only like weird like they, they, there's no there were no collapse the system type vulnerabilities there were just like weird things where like the, his whole deal was like if you had someone that's logged in here and then they went somewhere else and it was a cross-site thing and then someone was able to get their cookie or whatever and so the cookie policy and there's cookie policy and then crsrf and whatever but the main, the biggest takeaway was that, especially Agora, there are no publicly visible forms to begin with. You have to be logged in to even see a form. So a site scanner can't even find where the, what the mapping of the website is. Um, and there, there's so few places that you even do an input in that site because we do key login. So all the places you start to attack just don't exist, which was kind of interesting. Um, this one though we do have a uh, username and password login so we're starting with a place where you know you could potentially like people could spam that specific form because that's the one that's open um so we're so i'll have him come back and do this site like you know attack this and see what he see what he has to say um one nice thing about having all this open and having implemented the web server within the client module is that any of it I can change. So when he says you need to do this, I can just go do that. Even if it's annoying, I can just go do it. Because none of it's hard coding, it's just like annoying. Anyway, we parse the request. We, if the request is complete, like once it's complete, remember we, inside of parse, we actually have an accumulator. So if half the request came in, there's an accumulate phase. So this should return a complete request or error out. Um, and check session. So that's going to populate the user if it's not populated. If it is populated, we bypass just use the existing one. That's why we pass that in as an argument. Uh, then dispatch. This is the one. This is your favorite function in here. Yes. Oh, this is this is OK. Sorry, I just got an email that I had to look at. OK. Never mind. Okay, let me look back at this. Okay, dispatch. Okay, so we got the next state from. Okay, dispatch, next state request. And then more. Okay, more is. Okay, so there's a lot going on here. Okay, dispatch. 
Okay, dispatch is the actual part that's handling this specific request after we've parsed it. Okay. Yes. So we've we've parsed the request. We've identified if we have a user that's a real user, like a logged in guy or not. Mm -hmm. Pack that into next state. And so now we're dispatching over next state with the completed request. And after parsing, if we have any trailing data that's the next request concatenated to this one, that's what's in more. And that's why we don't need it in dispatch, because we just want the request, the current request. There may be five more packed into this, but we don't care about that right now. We're just handling this one. So going to dispatch. Let me get dispatch one. Okay. In the case that the user is dead, like we get the session back, but it's dead. That'd be like a user that's logged out and the, uh, remember when AIDS is set to dead or whatever, we're setting, we're going to try to clear this cookie by setting max age zero. <coughs> so this is an attempt to clear out oh right because you can't unset a cookie i forgot i remember right that. you yeah. can like recommend to the browser that it unsets it but this is the best you can do is do set cookie overwrite it with whatever the new data is which in this case is dead and set the max age to zero and then collapse everything down to like you know this is basically the way to recommend that a browser kill clear a cookie but you can't make it do it um so that's, we're trying to do that here. Um, but we do handle the, the full request. We just have this like user that's, you know, this the dead user winds up with ID none. Um, so he's not logged in before we pass it on to dispatch to. Um, if he's not dead, then we just move on to dispatch two. Dispatch two is your favorite part with this URL scheme that's so good. What is messy? Oh, okay. So this is a different, you, this is a different, oh, right. Cause it's a different application. Oh, we still have gorilla dicks. Of course Actually. we do. Um, doesn't include, okay. I'm not going to ask. We're um, still servicing Harambe, but, um, <laughs> yeah. So sign mess um, is the, um, he puts the Haram in Harambe. Okay. Anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah. So sign mess is the, um, uh, key login. Right, yeah, yeah. And that's basically just pulled straight out of Agora. The main difference here is that the time zone offset is not per user, it's per shop now. So there's a little bit different thing going on with time zone offsets. Um, which is time why I did that whole video the other day trying to look up all these different time zones. Times, time, uh, okay. But let me... Uh, let me okay give me a second to think about that the reason the time zone offset so 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 let, let's back up why are we considering time zones in the first place why why does that matter because all? all dates are universal and this is a global site so on the agora mm -hmm. case you've got someone logging in from like their laptop at the airport okay their time zone just changed literal jet lag at the moment that they log okay. in, we're checking what their time zone offset is because we care where their what the offset is so that we can render pages correctly for them because we're not doing time widgets for timestamps. We're not doing JavaScript time widgets. What? Jo so like the chat messages what? between why, you, why does... the chat messages between buyer and seller, for example. Okay. They have to be timestamped. Unless you're a weird person, you don't think in UTC. Right. You want to know that the seller re responded to your question two hours ago, right? Oh, I see. Okay. Oh, look, it's 12 right now. This guy wrote me back at 10. Oh, wait, no, he wrote me back at 10 mountain time. Ha ha ha, jokes on me. No, that's fucking stupid. So everything's right. time stamped and then converted to your time when the page is shown to you. And to mm. do that, you need to have the time offset. 
to get an accurate time offset, okay. you need to ask the browser, what's your time offset? But then JavaScript does it wrong and in minutes and backwards. So, oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It gives you the time zone in negative minutes. I remember, I remember, I remember correct. your like freak out when you learned about that. Yeah. And so, I what remember, we do is we take the time offset and we multiply it by minus 60. That's right. That's right. It's and a, then we get the actual negative. seconds time offset that we can really use to actually set, you know, show what a time. What the fuck comes up with giving giving a time offset in negative minutes? I have no idea. It doesn't, there, there's <laughs> no just... systems that do it this way. That's why that time zone but, video that I did the other day was like so full of like me kind of going, what? Because there were so many weird moments in that. Um, just like finding out that that was even a thing. Like if I do that Tom Scott video, I don't know if you watched that, but that that he he goes through basically all all this. the same nonsense that you went through, but in ten minutes. This and he, yeah. Oh right. Okay. Here, let me let me blow it up. Ah, fuck. Wrong window. So this is this um, is in the signature screen. And there's a hidden element. There's a hidden element in that form, in the sign-in form, that's the time zone offset. The reason I'm mentioning that is that we, I pulled this out of Agora, but then here I'm not actually using that time zone offset. That's going to change, um, mm. and be something else. Oh, it's times my. So the time offset is now per shop, because each shop, like e each place of business, is constrained and locked down by its own jurisdiction, right? It's in a jurisdiction. That jurisdiction has a time zone and accounting as relates to that specific shop is bound by whatever the local what, timekeeping is. What if they're in Israel? I mean, what if they're in Israel? They have a time zone. Is Israel has two time zones that depend based on your ethnicity. No, that's all fake. There's just one. <laughs> okay. Okay. For for accounting purposes, you're okay, gonna, yeah, yeah. for accounting purposes, you're gonna say what your time zone is, and when you right. when you pick like when you set your shop up, you pick what that offset is. It's up to you. We can mm. recommend one based on what the browser says, but that's all it is. It's like I haven't written. I'm gonna write mm. it today. It's an HTML uh, um, selector list, and we're gonna pick the one that your browser claims to be in. But if that's not yours, right. then pick a different one before you create your shop. Right. And that's a thing you can edit too. But that's, so from that point, all of the timestamps that get logged, oh. like all the logging stuff that applies to a specific sale that your shop is doing is based off of that offset. Will that consider daylight savings as well? So, like, will it automatically update whenever there's daylight savings? It won't be automatic. You'll have to change the time zone for the shop. Okay. Pe people are not... Okay. Yeah, they're going to fuck it up. That's their problem. Yeah, okay. I mean... Sorry. Well, I mean, do I need to go bake the bread at your bakery, too? No. <laughs> Like, but the, I mean, well, you're in business, so you need to deal with some business concerns, and this is one of the million things you got to deal with when you're in business. I mean, this is how it is. Yeah, God, God, I hate time. I hate daylight saving so much. It's the dumbest. I do too. Um, you, but you, at you least... should just have it say there's no there's no daylight savings in Japan, so there's no daylight savings. Well, but for the pilot project, that's literally true. Hmm. That is a very good point. Okay. Like, what point. matters Never here? Heard. I'm serving people that matter to me. And they don't fucking know what daylight savings time even is because it's such a retarded idea would fit in their head. So, don't have to I worry about that. Like, uh, so, so where did... I'm wondering, Okay, you know what? This isn't a stream about daylight saving. Let's Let's continue. Yeah. Like, if this project takes off and we make money and everything's great and, you know wonderful we're getting like two percent service fees from people and we're in business now right then i will go back right. and find some way to automate that but right now i don't give a shit well we'll hire we'll hire we'll hire someone to automate that we'll hire someone to automate that yeah that's about the the way it works right um anyway we'll Daylight Savings time, it, it, it's a crappy thing that like there's not a really good way to deal with it in an automatic 
sense. Also, daylight savings time changeover days sometimes are different in different jurisdictions. It's not uniform. Yeah, they're they're different in every country. They're all they also don't like some country like um that t you you got to watch that Tom Scott video. Like he he went over like every single thing that could go wrong with time zones. Like for instance, Libya announcing that they're going to change their time zone um with like with like 24 hours of notice. Um then like oh and then and then leap seconds. Yeah, yeah. Like right. Imagine yeah. having to deal with 61 seconds in a minute. <laughs> it's just like <laughs> Right, no, but that's the thing that you have to do. And sometimes it's like things that are out of your control. It's not like some arbitrary thing like you'll have a physical event that happens that change literally change time by a second like a big earthquake um or it's right or yeah and it's like well okay over the last three years we've literally drifted a second off of what a side real day was supposed to be and so we want right. to correct it and what do you do you insert a leap second and fortunately we almost never notice it and that's what time drift was originally in airline too like if um what is it ntp um if the network time service realizes that the system time is off and it just resets the system clock all of your timers might go off right now or they might all pause for like 18 hours right mm. that kind of thing can happen in systems and if like Imagine if that's a game backend. Jesus Christ. And you've just got timers for the like the decay of world items that people have like set on the ground, right? Mm. Um, oh, and they all go off at once. Yeah. They all go off at once. So everything in the world just expired all at the same time. So you're in Daisy and you're starving, and now you're now you're really starving. Or everything stays on the ground and nothing repopulates for another day like it's all just old decayed items for a whole day until the like the background economy starts up again because the timer was delayed for like it because this time gap was huge um so right. to keep that from happening like the old airlang the reason that we didn't have monotonic time guarantees in airlang was that um the timestamp facilities that gave you system time were different from the like Erlang now from the now function that just gave you a mm. timestamp. The timestamp would try to give you monotonic time, but the way it would do that is if there was a huge shift from start time to now, and it knew how long it was running because it was keeping track of that. But then it looks at how long the system thinks it was running. And it's like some crazy different number. It will start, dr it'll time drift to the correct time over a period of like two days. So you, mm. so you get squishy okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that was one of the things. He, so the the way there are basically two ways that you could handle the um, sixty one seconds in a minute thing, which was either the make a second just slightly longer, and then just over a long time period fix that, or you could like redo all of your data models so that there's sixty one seconds in a minute sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, but only once every like three thousand years or whatever, um, and mo and depend and again depending on your application, maybe you'd need one or the other. Yeah, I mean it's just it time is at this real. point it's amazing. Like the airline runtime because this is <clears throat> using so many different backend systems now that can never go down, like all over the world for all kinds of shit. Um, you know, banks, telecom, satellite systems, like control systems, all kinds of things. Um, scientific measurements the uh what should happen when time is not reliable anymore when like the network time you know ntp tells you something that like your system time is way off um and has to correct it now has it's like this is it's got the most detailed time model anywhere that i've seen and you can pick which which strategy is going to be applied you can set that, tell the runtime which strategy will be applied, and that will change the output that you get from different types of time mm. functions in the system. And 99% of the time, you don't care. You just don't care. 
but if you're in one of these but really really specific care. like scientific measurement kind of applications you really do yeah it's one yeah it's one of the things when you don't care you don't care but when you care you really 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 care it's like performance most of the time you don't care yeah usually it doesn't most matter of the time as, as long as you're not being stupid it doesn't matter right and then but when it matters it really matters mm -hmm. yeah okay um so, so sign okay what happens here is uh based on the path the requested path we pass in we dispatch on the path which may be totally consumed like there's no extra stuff on the path here we just go to index mm. of the state um and index changes wildly based on who's logged in because the front page they want to see is like the snapshot of their business at the moment right why are we doing password login because we have to be able to log in with mobile devices a cashier has to be able to log into the system and generate transactions for her boss okay small shop they don't have a laptop at the desk they've only got a phone Okay. They're going to open mobile Firefox, log into the site, push the new trend, you know, new, uh, new payment button to generate a payment thing and show the QR code mm -hmm. to their customer. And they're going to scan it straight from the phone, right? How does she log mm -hmm. in without superhero? <laughs> she has a different phone, but yeah, I, I get what you're, I get no, what you're saying. So what? Like, you can't log in with Superhero on mobile right now. Oh, because we would need to do the, uh, the, um... The AIDS the, protocol the, thing. Okay. You, you have to it. have dead drop signatures, um, and we don't have that right now. Because that's a wallet feature that I'd have to write that feature into the wallet and make them compliant with that and publish a standard for it. Right. And the, the chaos that does exist currently forbids that so no right okay so we have a uh, key login and we also have password login now the way that i'm going to prevent people from spamming and trying to log in so there's two things one if you do log in as somebody's cashier account you can't actually hurt that business there's nothing you could take from them Right, you can just give them money and that's it. Okay, yeah. Right. The thing that you Okay, and so the password is only for the I see. Okay. Right. So you can't be like you, a business owner account can't be a password account. A cashier's can. Mm, okay. So the you can't log in like that's also the thing like to do refunds, you mm -hmm. have to be able to sign the refund transaction, right? Right. So even if you log in, you see these refunds and it's got little buttons next to it you can click. Like you get behind the counter and there's a full laptop there. Um, mm -hmm. If you see, if you're in a password login account and they don't have a browser extension, they don't have Superhero installed, you cannot sign a refund. Right. So you can't get back there and say, I want to get paid back for this. Find your old transaction, click refund, make or cancel it. Now it's already been paid though. So now it goes to the refund pile, open the refund page and then click pay it and then it's going to say i can't find your wallet so you can't you cannot force a payout from the register and you should never have your fucking private key that's for your it. business at the register that's crit so we can we can just like that's a, so like robbing the the can <laughs> robbing the stores there's going to an be an instant right we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna be responsible for people getting shot just because somebody's gonna like try to rob a store and the cashier is not gonna be able to dispense funds and she's gonna get shot you could do it like um zoolander and tell them no the money's in the computer and they just go like monkey monkey they're trying to break the computer and they just steal they they just steal the computer they steal the computer and think they got something yeah or or or, or i mean that's not as bad as like if it was Bitcoin and then like they, okay, we transferred you things. Okay. You got to wait for like 20 and four hours <clears throat> mm -hmm. transaction to clear. Yeah, that exactly. So this is the thing though. Like you can't, 
there's limits on how much damage you can do getting into one of these accounts. It just doesn't matter. Um, mm. So we can protect the vendor from like storefront shenanigans with naughty customers. Um, completely. They, they just, they can't do anything weird from here. So, so password login, it's not my favorite thing, but it kind of, you know, it'll work for this. Another thing is that there's a combinatric problem. If you're an attacker and you want to try to log into somebody's account, you have to know their username and their password, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the usernames are not arbitrary. The usernames are generated by the user IDs, which are integer IDs that come from the system. Okay, so people aren't choosing their own username. Correct. Okay. So it's essentially a random number and then another really big random number that you'd have to guess. I'm curious what messy you is. That is the current... Um, I, that, I believe, is the new... Hmm? I think that's the new business one. Oh, unknown you. Okay. Yeah, that's a new... I haven't done that one yet, regardless. Um, yeah, that looks that looks like a template for something you're going to do later. Okay. Yeah, and so a lot of these are going to change because I've real Like the login, the password login thing, I just realized the need for that the other day. Because there's no way to get around mm. it. Some, there's some things like that. So this is still like a work in progress. I need to think through like, what are the cases? And like, what I want to do right now um, is like the new business thing that works now. And we have the post version of that already. Same thing with sign mess to like log in that works. Password login is not implemented yet. I did it. Remember I did it like a long time ago, but I need to do a new one. Um, log out works. The anonymous thing Apparently, I broke that somehow, but whatever. Um, anyway, the new business thing, uh, that works, but inside of the business page, what's happening in new business right now, <coughs> excuse me, is uh, when you register your business, that's the moment it creates a user for the first time for you creates your first shop and creates your business registry um, mm. <clears throat> all at the same time. So it's a one for one, like this is technically nested, right? So business users exist on their own. Okay. And a user can only belong to one business and one shop at a time. Um, so like whatever shop they're assigned to businesses can have any number of shops, any number of workers, the shop itself could have any managers and any workers working at it, and it belongs to a single business. So this is a tree. This is nested, right? Um, right. Everything here, though, is just one for one. Like, the assumption here is that the first time you create this, the most common case is going to be a sole proprietorship. So they don't have an extra shop and a bunch of extra stuff. Right, and you're not... <clears throat> and uh, eventually, eventually, we're going to have to deal with the case of, like, employee, like... A woman get you know quits her job at business A, and moves over to business B. Nope. And new wants to like keep new account. Okay. Yep. New account. Not dealing with that. Nope. Not dealing with that. All right. No. Um, <clears throat> because I mean that's not that's not a normal thing to use. It's not like this is her social media account that follows her around. Um, I was gonna say that like, I was gonna say that like if you wanted. I, I was gonna. I was gonna suggest. I will not suggest, but think about like the make making it into social media. I know that that's that's very antithetical to your personality, but for something like GitHub, that proved to be a very fruitful business model until Microsoft ruined it. Yeah, the, but that's more like an Agora thing. Agora is sort of inherently more like that. And yeah. you have community reputation. The thing that, that'll sort of square the there's circle, the, or the... the thing that'll complete the circle, rather, on Agora is, remember I had the uh, um, the buys, like the buyers that want something that's not listed yet? Mm. 
having buyers that can log in and say, I want to buy something, but it's not here. Please sell me an X. That will sort of complete the complete the circle in terms of having both sellers and buyers and trying to figure out a good way to match them up with each other. Um, ultimately, I would like to come up with a recommendations thing where like, I'm looking for a thing that's like this and then have the system say, well, in here we've got these sale items that match what you're looking for and try to match that up. But first I have to get to a bids model, which I haven't done yet. I did that originally and then it was messy and I just got rid of it to get sales working right early. And I think that was a win. It was a, it was better to do that in the short term because the sales thing, it feels like a sales site, right? It's not confusing. Um, the buying side of stuff is something that users have to kind of learn. That's why, you know, but, but that makes it powerful because it kind of makes it like a, um, what's it called? Classifieds where you want to sell a thing or you want to buy a thing you can put you can put a thing up on Agora and it says, I want to buy a thing. And then if you're looking at that and be like, what can I sell? Cause I want some AE. You could look at like, Oh, this guy wants to buy a baseball bat. Well, I have a baseball bat and then contact him and have a conversation about it and then make a sale item. But that sale item is actually kind of like for him. So it would pop up in his alerts, like, Hey, there's the thing for sale that you want right here. That's, that's not social media exactly. Um, but it is a thing where like you would gain reputation and keep it over time because as a seller, especially you want to have as high trust reputation as you can get from reviews from people after you sold stuff because it's totally online. So anyway, this is not really social media in the sense that like, this is for in-person sales <clears throat> and in-person sales, the societies around you, you don't need media. Right. Like the neighborhood, the neighborhood that you're buying that bread in is the society. You don't need social media. You can like, just look around. Hmm. Not looking at your phone. Look at the shopkeeper. So anyway, that's the idea right now um, with this, but that anyway, this creates just a one for one, one shot with one employee who is the owner and a business record for him. And that's it. It's all one thing. What needs to be able to happen though, is like, if I'm here and I register, um, well, actually I already registered. Let me go back to the, uh, log in. Okay. So being logged in here, I've got a new sale thing, but that's just whatever. Um, what I need to do is make like today's transactions. Again, I was just playing with the tables layout here. What I need, what I need to do is have like your list of shops and their transactions and then add a shop and then, you know, employee management, like employee accounts or cashier accounts or whatever, um, add and remove cashier accounts or, or whatever. Um, I need to put those options on the screen here and then write paths to, to being, to doing that, to updating those in, in the record. And uh, when I show this page, so this is index, right? Remember I said like the, what you see in the index is going to change dramatically based on who you are. If you're the owner or the employee or, um, or a manager of a shop, your your page is going to be very different for the index because that's your top view of like what the business that's your quick view of like how do you do work this page you should be doing your work from this page basically and so that page is going to be different based on who you are what your role in the business is if you're an employee and you're working at a specific shop then you're at that shop and you want to see like the cash register screen basically right that's not the same thing as the owner page that gives you like the overview of the whole business. Like all the transactions that all the shops have done in the last 24 hours. That's the employers. That's what the, the business owner sees. The individual cashier sees just that cashier, what I've done this last 24 hours. 
at this shop. And if you change to another shop, like, okay, in the morning, I'm going to work at this shop. Afternoon, I'm going to work at that shop. When you log in over there and you pick the shop that you're at, you're just seeing that shop in your history. You understand what I mean? Kind of. Anyway, that the index page is the get work done page. Because okay. from the cashier's perspective, they should do new sale, show the QR to the guy, the guy pays or not, you check it in the log, it's paid or it's not. The end, next, new sale, scan the thing, because that's not your job. Like, your job is not inside the computer. Your job is, like, doing the cashier shit and, like, doing whatever it is that you do in that store normally. This should just right. be as quick as possible. Click new sale. Get the QR code. Like, put the price in. Get the QR. And then it's in the log. Did he pay or not? And it's going to tell you within, like, five seconds right. if he paid or not. And that's it. Then if he double paid or if he doesn't want to pay with AE, he's like, oh, wait, 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 wait. I want to pay cash. Can I can I roll that back? And you go, well, you can't roll it back, but we can refund you. Let me put it in the refund queue. And so you click cancel, and it goes in the refund queue, and they'll get paid back whenever that's looked at, right? But right. the cashier's job is not all in the computer. This should just be like a quick screen, and that's it. So the index page, right. they don't they shouldn't go through a menu to get to the work part. The work part should just be right here. And that's it. And so their, right. their total of pay transactions for the day with the list price, when I say list price, that's what's significant in accounting for, well, it depends on jurisdiction, but a lot of places are going to charge you the yen price. They're going to say, we're going to tax you sales tax on that yen price. They don't care what the AE was, that's incidental. And then later, if they convert that to fiat, then they're going to say if there's capital gains or if you get a tax credit back for it, if it went up or down. So having totals at the bottom of this, so like AE, all of the paid ones, all the paid ones would be in their own section with the subtotal. All the unpaid ones, all the pending ones, will not affect the subtotal of that cashier for the day because they haven't been paid yet. And if you cancel an unpaid one, well, it just like didn't happen, you know? Right. So, so that's the I point see. of this screen. And for the boss... He might be doing sale items, right? So you need to have that available to him. He can assign himself to whatever shop he wants to be at. But most of the time, the boss is not going to be doing the sales himself unless he's a sole proprietor. So, But he needs to be able to create new shops. Like, oh, cool, I want to use this. I've got three bakeries in town. And, well, I've only got one here, but make new shops. I make new shop. And then I'm going to name that some arbitrary thing so that I can remember it. Inside the system, it's just, its ID is like a, a number, some integer. Right. Um, but he's going to put a string on it, right? And now the reason I'm showing these numbers, though, is that the cashiers are always going to see these numbers all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And if they're different, they're going to notice. Somebody else could, like, take a picture of the screen and then go register a business and fake this, right? To fake the strings. Mm. They can't fake the number. So you get behind the cash register, you log out and you log some cashier's position in to your business that you changed all the strings on to look a certain way to trick them. So they pay you instead of the, their own business. That oh, num I see. That so, number's so that different. Business that business, no matter what, is business 37. Yes. Somebody could create a fake version of Page, conceivably, and make it look exactly. But yeah, I see what you mean. Right. Yeah, you could try to fake some of this. <clears throat> That's why I was looking at the uh, visual hashes. So visual the, hashes. Yeah, like create a... Um, and I was looking at the... One of the things I was looking at was using the game of life thing to like create a pattern that's like very low resolution, very blocky, but you could identify it right away mm -hmm. with a color thing that would be based on whatever, probably like a payout key, the public key for the pay target. 
So, mm-hmm. th- and that would be here. And if that changed, it'd be really, really fucking obvious. And you couldn't fake that. It'd be really like, it'd be very, very hard right. to fake that with a different site. That's a good point. Okay. Hmm. So that's the thing. That's a problem I'm going to solve eventually. But for right now, I'm just using these integers. Um, because it's not hard to remember. Like, it's it's not going to be... If there were millions of shops, then it would be harder to kind of lock down. But most people can, like, tell if a phone number is different pretty quick. And that's the scale of number. That That's the, that's the outside edge of the size of number that we're going to be looking at. It's like phone number size. So we have plenty of runway to come up with a visual hash later. Um, but in the early days, we're talking dozens of shops, hundreds maybe. I mean, that's pretty sick. If we get to hundreds of shops, man, we're fucking, we're winning, you know? Right. If we have hundreds, I mean, just, okay. Like, let, let's just, let's just walk through this. We have a hundred shops mm-hmm. and they're each doing... One hundred dollars worth of transactions a day. Yeah. That's okay, that's good. ten thousand dollars. That's ten thousand dollars. We get two percent of that, which is okay. So we get two dollars. We get two hundred dollars a day, which is actually a surprising amount of money. Yeah, that's doing pretty good. That, that's a good startup, yeah. man. That's fucking. That's moving along. That's yeah. That's thirty six thousand a year. That's yeah. that's that's not enough to feed your kids, but that's enough. If if you had you know if if the shops were do, were doing a thousand dollars a day, yeah, that's that's a yeah, that's so this is that also moves the uh, it completely changes the um, the prospect of using AE to begin with. It changes the value proposition of the chain radically. Mm. So you can get accelerating adoption based on a little bit of adoption, right? Um, that, but that's that was my whole point about this originally uh when like some of the wacky people didn't want to like hear what i was talking about when i was saying agora can't well first off agora can't just be an open source code base because a private company's paying for it right um so you can't just give all of its code away there's not even a there's not even like a branding thing committed to agora yet um you can open like you get Amazon. You could open source the Amazon code base now without them really risking anything, but you couldn't do it early. Right. Twitter, Twitter open source their code base. Yeah. And then and then Facebook, Facebook try Facebook literally stole. I I may have the facts wrong, so fact check me. But I believe that Mark Zuckerberg's rip off of Twitter Threads, they literally stole Twitter's code base and tried to make that a thing on Instagram. And the only people who went there were like journalists and like <laughs> nobody else. <laughs> That's, okay, but you see how powerful Mindshare is, right? So until you get there, though, you can't just right. like open things up. What we do open up already is the contracts are fully open. Yes, yes, yes. You can yes. go browse the smart contract code right now, and it's not very confusing to understand how they work. Um, and the worst thing you could do knowing that code base is you could try like, sort of kind of DOS people, but you can't, you can't steal money from them. And trying to DOS through smart contracts means you have to go learn how to do Sophia stuff also. Um, like the barrier, there's no right. win there. It's a technically complicated task. Um, and it's just, anyway, that's just silly. But the, uh, but the contracts are open source because I think it's right to do that. Um, the back end itself is not entirely. Though I'm talking through a lot about how this works. I mean, right now it's like right. if and you've got the gumption to go write you're... some shit, go write it. But it's like there's not even a web server. I wrote the web server. How much do you really want to, you know, dingle fuck with coding stuff to try to make a thing work? That's you know stealing like yeah. stealing the code is less of a win than people think. Um so anyway. Yeah. But my whole point with like Agora was that to buy stuff on Agora, you have to have AE. Well, getting AE is a significant pain in the ass to begin with, just the, the beginning part. So you have to make mm-hmm. that as favorable a thing as possible. 
Um, and to make that a favorable thing, you have to be able to do business in more than just one shop. Um, so to answer the question, what can I do with crypto? Well, you can use AE and you can go shopping at this one site or you can sell stuff at this one site. Well, that's cool. Um, and the size of that site is really dictated by the number of items available. So, I mean, one way to kind of improve that would be to go do a whole bunch of just-in-time sales there. Uh, you know, the, the uh, Andrew Tate method, right? Like, you don't have anything? Just go online and put things up for sale. When someone orders it, then you buy it. Okay, you could do that. That's legit. That's actually a legit strategy for online sales. Um, put a whole bunch of different stuff out and see what sells because you have no idea. All right. I enjoy your Andrew Tate impression. <laughs> yeah, but okay, I get I get what you mean. But that but that's a legit strategy. I mean, he's he's kind of a spaz the way he fucking expresses things, but that's his whole shtick, right? Um he doesn't talk like that normally, which is funny. Uh but that's I I I I don't want to get into a discussion about Tate. Um yeah, okay, I I understand what you mean. Yeah, that's my point is that his his strategy for just-in-time sales for online stuff makes sense. Uh, especially for the Agora case, it's perfect. If you, especially if you already have stuff to sell that you're selling in Fiat already, like if you have an Etsy store or something, it makes perfect sense. It's like costs you nothing to get in on Agora like already. And if people do that, cool, that's good. However, you still can't go down the street and just like buy a thing at a shop. So I got to fix that problem too before I try to push too hard on any of this stuff. And like, okay, cool. I can sell a thing on Agora. Nice. But I have a restaurant. Can I charge my customers an AE or not? Like, is there any crossover? And if the right. answer is no, then that's not a very good proposition. So right. my view I on think... that is that this has to get fixed. And then I can like kind of hype everything out because then it makes sense right. to like hold AE. And it makes sense to deal with the KYS or KYC, <laughs> KYC should be KYS. Kind of like that, but, um, anyway, the KYC. It's a Freudian stuff because you're talking to me. Anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you, you know what I mean. Um, yeah. Dealing with that shit, the one, because you only have to register with like Gate.io. And it's one of the only exchanges that actually does just exchange stuff. They don't do all this weird like. We have our own token and give us all your fiat and all your crypto so we can rape you like FTX. Like they're not doing that bullshit. They're just an exchange and they're really responsive. Like if you have a problem and you write to their uh, customer service thing, they write you back in like a couple of minutes. They're really, it's amazing that they they stay on top of their shit. So you register there once, which is fucking annoying. And then everything works. Okay. We should mention we are not, we are not sponsored by gate. It's just, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. We, we, and we, we can't, I guess we can't really say anything else, but, uh, I wish I was but, sponsored but, by Gate. Hey, Gate, sponsor us. <laughs> but, uh, well, it's just, it, God, God, exchanges are just such shady. Mm -hmm. If you have, uh, I'll, I'll just say, we, we can't uh, have more freedom you, to speak have, about this soon, but not yet. Yeah. If you have, uh, if you have your, if you have money on exchanges, I would very, 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 very strongly recommend that you get it on ch on an off exchange wallet that's on the chain as quickly as possible. Yeah, there was a uh, that would, that would be my there was a phrase that we used to have <clears throat> back in the day that people have forgotten. I think people said it so much that it got annoying and people stopped saying it. But not your keys, not your crypto. That's a, oh, they had that in the, that they had that posted on the sign in Cryptoland. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. But, so the oh, Cryptoland, what the? It's like the cringiest. Anyway, um, the the ridiculous stuff that's gone on with anyway. crypto. Anyway, um, the whole point being that if you don't hold the private key to crypto that's actually on chain. If you don't own that private key, then it's not yours. That was the entire proposition of crypto at the beginning. The exchanges came along and they created what's called custodial systems where they are custodians of your funds and they just tell you, yeah, you've got stuff, we promise. And then 
I mean, that, that's no different than a bank, except, you know, banks at least. It's Yeah, it's no different from a bank, except if banks are looking to screw you from the beginning, they're not going to be banks very long. And with the Ponzi, the Ponzified nature of where crypto crap has gone in the last, like, especially the last three years has been insane. Um, which, I mean, that coincides with people like not even being allowed to do real work all over the world for to a large degree. Um, so I, I right. kind of understand how this manifested. It's just that that like the, the custodial systems for crypto combined with the Ponzi thing where it's like an open secret that a lot of crypto became this big Ponzi scheme and people who, uh, the people who were attracted to that are scammers. Like, so the bank manager that you expect, like, the bank manager that you expect to meet at like the local bank in you know Dusselheim, Germany, is like a banker, and you expect him to be like this kind of boring, stodgy guy who's very particular about you know keeping the books straight. And the crypto people are not like that. You're not dealing with the same type of person. You're dealing with no, somebody you're, who you're understands cool. this is a fly by night thing, and when it's done, I'm gonna disappear with all your shit, and I'm fine with disappearing and changing my name and become like that's who those people are. Don't trust them. All right. So two things. Mm -hmm. Number one, I have to pee because I drank like a gallon of tea. One, now um, the whole world two, knows. I do. I know, but th that's fine. Number two, I have kind of run out of mental stamina to continue with the coding, and it's been like two hours, so I think this is a good time for a break. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. You go do that. I'm. This will just be its own little thing, and me messing with the system or i might do a digression video i don't know all right um anyway we'll see but yeah we'll go ahead and cut this here so all right do, do you under you understand how the system basically works now right uh i understand it and i i, I sort of it's a first pass thing where I, I i get the idea this is a much simpler system than agora and right so right I get, I get, I get, I get the basic idea that you, you could go read like the ledger. You could go read the, the complicated ones, AJ ledger, AJ rates and AJ chain. You could go read those three independent, knowing what you know about this and just understand how they fit in now without too much trouble. Right. I have a, I, I have a high level overview and well, and the original purpose of this was more the abstract problem of when you're look at learning a new project how do you learn it and basically the answer to that is you start with the top level application module then you go look at sort of the tr the supervision tree mm -hmm. and then you say okay what what is it that talks to the outside world and you kind of deep dive into that mm -hmm. and and basically from that point you just kind of trace call chains yeah that yeah that's really it that's exactly right so yeah so okay. That, you know, then if you trace a couple of call chains, be like, when I click this, what happens? And you know kind of where to go to look for that. Um, the peripheral utilities like AJ Karen, AJ Rates, Chain, stuff like that, Ledger, those all fall into place. Like, oh, that's what this does. Well, of course, we would have needed that. So that's there. And you can read it basically in isolation and understand what it does. Because mm -hmm. it just has interface functions. There's no, like, global shit happening. So you can, right. you can make sense of them. They all tie together through pretty much what the AJ client does for the most part. Okay. Like most all activities right. being initiated from there, if there's a couple things that are timed, rates has a timer to call these external services and ask what are the exchange rates right now? And then chain has a timer to ask the eternity node in the back, back end out here. Like what's, you know, give me the next micro blocks. And then it just does its work looking through them to match like the transactions it expects to see versus what it actually sees on the chain. Like it's not that complicated. It's just a lot of like detail. The tedious part from now is actually doing this, like uh, doing the pages themselves, like actually writing the HTML for the pages and uh, then testing everything to find the bugs. Cause there's going to be bugs. Um, but then, right. but that's it. Like, that's why I was confident, like, this is not going to be that hard of a target to hit. It's just going to take some time to code it.
Well, and also you have you have a lot of experience writing business software. Like this is your thing. And so you already in your head kind of already know what to write. Yeah, I just don't like the web version of it. If this was like a WX program, it'd be so much nicer to me. That's that's interesting because me I, I, WX is. I guess it's oh no no no, no. it's it's unambiguously better than the web. Yeah, I did not. I did. I, I would not have agreed with that two years ago. But but just having seen the underbelly of the web. Well, it's also just... faster. Like where I don't have to write a like a catch layer. Like this whole web server wouldn't exist. Right. The web, you have to, like, there's this client server model that's totally unnecessary, and you have to write this whole, like, basically assume your user interface is hostile. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, which none of that is the thing that you have to worry about with WX. So all that code complexity is gone. You don't have the web center to deal with. And each, each, like, genuinely unique activity that the user might be doing, like, if you're the business owner, I would make like a business owner interface. And if you're Mm -hmm. the cashier, that'd be a different, that'd be different window code. I wouldn't like have to mix them together because you don't have a single handler. Like it's just easier to, it's just easier to like, uh, it's like writing a game. Um, Like when I wrote Minesweeper, right? You're like, okay, I'm going to write a cashier today. Okay. I'm going to write sim manager today. I'm going to write sim business right. owner today and I'm going to write sim cashier tomorrow. You know, it's not, it's not that hard um, to, to conceive of like how to do this. The hard part is just deciding how do I want the screen to look and, but you have the same problem with the web. Like, how do I want the thing to look like, look at this shit's ugly right now. Um, it's, it's already beginning to be coherent, but like, I can't decide where am I going to put the, uh, the shop thing? Should I have like a shops section? And then current shop, and then make new shops, and then today's transactions, and then I got to break these down by shop. Should that be intermixed, like make a new shop or get rid of it or whatever within that? Or I don't know. So stuff like that, I got to like sort out. All right. All right. Well, I, I, I'm dancing, so I'll, I'll cool. be back Have fun. in a second. All right. <laughs>